I want to start by telling you a story. Mary's father left their family home when she was still small and her mother couldn't pay the rent. So Mary's mother was sent to the workhouse and Mary was sent to the orphanage. She won a scholarship to the grammar school, but she couldn't afford to take it up. So she left school without any qualifications when she was 13. She went into domestic service as a scullery maid. Despite all that, Mary went on to qualify as a teacher, have three children, study for an education honours degree whilst working full time, and eventually to become a very successful head teacher. Fast forward to the late 1980s. Another woman is being interviewed by all the elected members of a large local authority. She's asked about her experience for the job, which is strong, but the next question is what her husband thinks of her applying for this post. She doesn't get the job. And finally, the year 2000. That same woman is asked if she could please try to improve the bond between civil servants and their female minister by talking to her about lipsticks. Mary, of course, is my own mother. And yes, I was the one facing that counsellor's question about my husband. And indeed, I too declined to talk about lipsticks. I'm used to being a bit of an outsider. Firstly, I'm not the archetypal perm sec. I went to a comprehensive school and studied at a red brick university. I'm not even a traditional civil servant, having spent the first 20 years of my career in local government, working for local authorities in England and Scotland. But by the time I leave this post in 2020, I shall have spent exactly half of my career managing and delivering services to the public and half in the civil service. This difference and longevity has given me valuable insight into and perspective on leadership, culture, and behaviours in different parts of the public sectors. I think the thing we need to be alert to is not to pick up people who are purely in our own image. So when we're including people to, for mentoring programmes, when we're encouraging people to take on new recruitment opportunities, take on new responsibilities, let's ensure that we're thinking about the diversity of what those people represent. Let's not keep thinking, that person's like me, so therefore they must be great, because quite often that's not the case. For me, Resilience is a really important part of being a senior leader. Understanding what makes you feel more resilient, more energetic, more passionate about what you do, and ensuring that you can sustain even in the, in the face of really difficult uh, challenges and circumstances. And somebody once said to me, which I thought was a really good piece of advice, whatever it is that makes you more energetic, that makes you more resilient, do more of it. I think that's the piece of advice I still follow or try to follow whenever I can. In many organisations, I see women and men who are terrific technical contributors, but who find the step up to broader leadership roles a huge challenge. To be effective at this next level, they need to be prepared to find a new basis for their contribution, one that allows space for others one which means embracing uncertainty, but nevertheless presents a compelling vision of the future. Because how people behave, the patterns that we reinforce, the words we use unthinkingly, these all create an unwritten narrative that is far more compelling and powerful than any strategic framework. So a quote which I think really sums this up and which I use quite a bit is, what you permit, you promote. As leaders and change agents, this should be our mantra in embedding diversity and equality in the culture, characteristics and behaviours of our own organisations. The real below the waterline stuff. Culture is what really matters and we need to be vigilant and take nothing for granted. It's everyone's responsibility.